information theoretic abstractions for resource constrained agents via mixed integer linear programming. It will be presented by Daniel uh, Larson from Georgia Tech. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I think this, this talk is going to go right along with sort of the partitioning discussion in a sort of related sense that was just going on. So yes, I am presenting joint work here with uh, that I have done with Dipankar and Panos uh, titled Information Theoretic Abstractions for Resource Constrained Agents via Mixed Integer Linear Programming. Okay, so first I want to put you guys into the, let's see, if I, there we go. It, first, I want to put you into the mindset of what we are doing and why we're doing it. So I think a general theme of this whole workshop uh, so far has been that not agents are created equal and that perception and this decision making inter, incur computational costs. So what I've kind of shown up here uh, in the right hand corner is, you know, the, the recent Mars rover perseverance together with its uh, little autonomous helicopter ingenuity. Uh, when these two agents explore, say, the Martian environment or any other environment for that matter, it's not reasonable to assume that these two agents will, say, perceive the environment and base their decision making on the same inputs because obviously their computational and resource constraints are different for these two vehicles. Furthermore, if we have teams and swarms of agents, uh, we may not have all the same agents and operating in the same environment. And in this case, especially in, in cases where agents are collaborating on decision making or path planning or something of the sort, we have to consider individual agent resources when planning, especially when these uh, um, agents are communicating together and may have different communication constraints depending on where they are in the network. Uh, so as kind of a general theme of this workshop has been, is that agent resource limitations can stem from a number of sources, uh, some of which, which we kind of address in this talk, is limited onboard memory to store, say, environment maps, especially when these maps are very large or high dimensional, uh, and uh, limited uh, communication resources. So if a, agent A and B here need to uh, communicate and say they want to transmit part of, a, part of a map or the whole map to each other, it, provided that the, that the link that's connecting them has has limited uh, channel capacity, this will necessitate the need to compress the information before it's transmitted. Uh, and also obviously limited uh, onboard computing power in terms of deducing path planning and, and this sort of thing will arise the need to say uh, abstract in order to reduce the computational effort of executing graph search algorithms. So resource limited agents must compress and abstract environments to transmit maps to other agents across capacity limited channels and limited information processing in accordance with their available onboard resources, be it uh, computational or memory wise. So hopefully you've kind of gotten the sense now that, the, that this talk is mainly based on abstractions and how to perhaps generate them is what we're gonna talk about. But abstractions and autonomy in the general sense of are employed in order to simplify problem solving, right? And at the highest level, we can, we can view generating abstractions as the process of removing irrelevant details. And the application of abstractions uh, of various forms and sorts and autonomy is quite ubiquitous. And I just list a couple of, of examples here, but you can go to the literature for many more examples. Uh, and they're mainly employed in, in the applications we're looking at to reduce memory required for storing representations and to reduce the computational complexity of planning by say uh, generating reduced graphs and then executing say Dijkstra or A star graph search algorithms on the reduced graph. Now, abstractions come in many shapes and forms, but in this talk, we're going to mainly focus on ones that are hierarchical, so quad trees and oct trees, which are in and of themselves very powerful and uh, useful in autonomous systems. And we are using them because they, they provide a good structure and they allow for multi-resolution abstractions by simple pruning. We'll get into more detail about what that means in a minute. And they can be incorporated with other very powerful frameworks, uh, such as probabilistic trees, to allow for sensor uncertainty to be incorporated directly into the framework by in conjunction, say, with uh, occupancy grids. And uh, they've been employed in planning in order to reduce both the onboard storage to represent environments, but also to reduce the computational requirements of finding paths. They may not be optimal, but, in, but they reduce the, the computational burden of finding them. But a, but a big drawback that we're gonna address in, in this talk uh, to, to existing methods is that uh, existing methods for generating abstractions 
rely on user provided rules and do not incorporate information processing or communication constraints in a principled manner. What I mean by that is that the examples you see here for, from a small sampling of literature, although there are more examples of this, these abstractions are generated according to user provided rules of some notion of what is irrelevant and what is relevant, but there's no rigorous formulation that's incorporating, say, memory or communication constraints a priori directly in the formulation. Instead, these abstractions are generated in a known method beforehand, which is just kind of ad hoc depending on user provided rules. So what we're addressing in this paper and this talk is the development of a more rigorous, specifically information theoretically motivated approach for the emergence of abstractions that are task relevant for autonomous systems. And we're gonna focus on these abstractions in the form of hierarchical trees, but this is generalizable to other sort of structures as well. Okay, and the critical point here is that we want these abstractions to emerge, not to necessarily be provided beforehand. So uh, we, since we're in, invoking an information theoretic approach, I would just wanted to give you a little bit of a, bit of a background in terms of uh, how information theorists have classically approached the signal encoding problem, which has been studied for a long time. Uh, and uh, one of the predominant frameworks for this is called rate distortion theory, which basically finds an optimal encoding or a compression of, a, of an original signal X. Um, and uh, it does so by modeling the original signal by its statistics using probabilistic methods. And in this framework, we're just going to assume uh, that the original signal is X and the compressed representation is T. And these are random variables. And so formally, uh, the rate distortion uh, problem, it considers the following minimization problem, which is the minimization of mutual information between X and its reproduction T, where the mutual information can be, can be evaluated for a given encoder based off of the statistics that are provided to the problem. Uh, subject to this upper bound on this, what we call expected distortion, and, and this quantity is a, is a needed constraint because we could always, uh, minimizing mutual information is equivalent to maximizing compression. And of course we could, have, we could obtain you know, full compression by ignoring all the details of, of the signal. So this, uh, this expected distortion we have here is essentially constraining the abstraction quality to be within some certain limit. Now we're assuming here that the source is known and that the framework also assumes that this distortion measure, this is very crucial, is provided, and it's assumed small for good representations. And since we see here that we would like to maintain as small expected distortion as possible, we see that this distortion me measure is implicitly uh, quantifying which aspects of the original signal X are relevant in order for the distortion of the compressed representation to be as low as possible. Now, this problem is solvable via a uh, Lagrange multiplier method and invoking an algorithm called the Bahu Aramoto algorithm. But the crucial point here is that this method for defining relevance in a signal is good and, and proven, but it's uh, defining a good distortion function is very difficult in general for a desired task. So the question then becomes, are there alternate approaches that we could say in, invoke in order to take a more principled approach? And the, the answer is yes, and some of you may be familiar with this, but we're gonna invoke what's called the information bottleneck method. And this is what the remainder of the talk is about. And basically this is different from rate distortion that it directly considers the problem of encoding to preserve relevant information. And it does so by introducing a relevant variable Y. And, and the goal now is to explicitly maximize compression subject to a lower bound on uh, the relevant information where the relevant information in this case is quantified by the mutual information between T and X. And the, the visual notion you should have here is that you have some original signal X, uh, which we'd like to compress, but we'd like to compress it in such a way that our predictive ability regarding Y through the compressed representation T is as good as possible. And this creates a bottleneck in the sense that these two are conflicting in that we, to achieve better prediction, we achieve less compression and vice versa. So this offers a few benefits. It's completely independent of outside information. So no distortion function is required. All that I need to know is the joint distribution. So basically how the original signal and the relevant information are correlated. Um, and again, in this more general setting, uh, the problem is numerically solvable via an algorithm that's very similar to the Bahut Aramoto algorithm, but we won't delve into those details. But one of the crucial observations here is that this does not impose the structural constraints on the encoder. So this just says any valid conditional probability distribution can serve as a valid encoder and we could evaluate this cost function accordingly. But what we would like to do is use the IB principle here, not the IB problem necessarily, to, um, to formulate a task relevant tree abstractions or generate abstractions for autonomous systems. And to bring this into light, we'd, we'd like to do this by exploiting connection between trees and signal encoders. 
And uh, the observation here to bring to be able to formulate our problem accordingly is to view trees as deterministic encoders with specific structure. So what do I mean by that? So if I give you some grid, say TW here, this, this is the full tree, we're gonna call this the full tree, corresponding to the finest resolution of say a, a toy example here is just a four by four grid. In this case, the, the original signal has outcomes X1 through X16 as follows. And we could generate an abstraction or a multi-resolution uh, pruning basically of the tree TW and call it TQ by say aggregating some of the original nodes to uh, their parent nodes. In this case, it's a four by four example, but I think you can see how this can be generalized into a much larger tree. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that by, by, by aggregating the cells in blue and green, we aggregate these to parent nodes and thereby create an abstract representation. Now the connection here to signal encoders is that you can actually view the tree TQ as being represented by an associated encoder, which is deterministic, where each entry of the encoder is either one or zero, and the encoder uh, PT given X takes the value of one if and only if uh, the, the original signal or leaf node X is aggregated to uh, the leaf node of the tree TQ, okay? And why this is important, we're gonna talk to about in a minute, but it's important to note here that not all deterministic encoders correspond to trees in the space of feasible quad trees or whatever tree representation you're using. So we must enforce constraints. But for now, we're just gonna leave this, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but we're gonna leave this as just TQ. So uh, as a recap, of the previous slide, uh, we have basically established that each tree can be asso uh, associated with a corresponding encoder, and that the connection here now between encoders and trees and the, and the resolution of the space or the representation in this case is that by changing the encoder uh, or the tree, we toggle the multi-resolution representation of the world W. So we can see here that uh, by changing the tree, we change the representation, but equivalently, this can be viewed as by changing the encoder, we change the multi-resolution representation of the world. And furthermore, that if I associate uh, with each tree uh, an encoder, a deterministic encoder, uh, T given X, PQ T given X, then I can actually define a compressed random variable TQ, which has the following distribution, which can then of course be evaluated given the marginal distribution PX, but we assume we have that because we're given PX Y. Uh, and so it follows that actually for each tree, you can then evaluate the information theoretic quantities as a function of the tree instead of a function of an encoder, although these two are kind of equivalent notions as we just discussed. Um, and so basically given a tree TQ, we can now evaluate or quantify what the X and Y information of this tree is uh, by simply uh, as a function of the tree instead of uh, the traditional notions of um, mutual information as a function of the encoder. So what this lets us do and this is going to be the, 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 the topic for the remainder of the talk is that it allows us to formulate a, a multi-resolution tree abstraction problem by employing the IV principle. And so our problem is now to solve the minimization problem of, of the X information of the tree T, so that's equivalent to maximizing compression, subject to a lower bound here on the Y information or the relevant information is greater than or equal to D hat. And now we have this added constraint that T and TQ. So this, this is something we need to talk about in a minute, how we're going to handle that. And at the moment, uh, when we first looked at this problem, it's not obvious how this can be tractably solved. The space uh, T and TQ is, is obviously quite large for, for especially large grids. But in theory, this problem could be solved by exhaustive enumeration. But as I just mentioned, this does not scale well to large grid sizes. So this ne necessitates the need to go to alternative approaches for solving this. Um, and furthermore, I think one of some of the more persistent questions we had for ourselves is how do we even mathematically represent this uh, multi-resolution tree constraint? And, and this is something that the IB problem does not consider and, and renders the problem non-trivial. Now, it turns out that you can actually solve this by exploiting the structure of the specific problem that we're looking at here and to formulate what we will end up showing is uh, that this problem is solvable via a, an integer programming approach. So uh, one of the questions here that I just wanted to address is we, that we left kind of hanging from earlier part of the talk 
is that this TQ, this constraint that the tree has to, or the encoder has to correspond to multi-resolution tree, we didn't really talk about how that can be mathematically modeled or imposed as a constraint. So the question here then becomes, how can a multi-resolution tree even be parameterized in, in this framework? And one way of looking at this is that if I give you some tree, just say this tree here, where I've aggregated some of the original cells to the, to the parent, as we had talked about a few slides back, uh, one way of looking at this is uh, by looking at it in terms of the leaf nodes of the tree. And I think this is maybe quite natural because that defines directly what the multi-resolution representation is. But an alternative view of this is to look at it from the perspective of what we call interior nodes or expanded nodes. And those are the red nodes here. So uh, basically, it, these are two equivalent notions provided that you know the structure of this tree, is that if I give you the leaf node, it's equivalent to giving you me the interior nodes. So if you give me the interior nodes, I can tell you the leaf nodes and vice versa. And the interior nodes are, are particularly useful because this multi-resolution tree constraint can be quite straightforwardly stated uh, as the following condition that if a child is an interior node, then its parent must be too. So basically, if, if one of these nodes is red, then its parent must also be red. So uh, the, the key observation here, as I've kind of already hinted at, is that the, the set of interior nodes completely characterizes the tree in the same way that the leaf nodes do. And crucially then, uh, each tree can thus be, be represented essentially by, uh, by a Boolean vector, where each entry of Z here is either zero or one. And the entry of Z basically tells us that uh, what the expansion status of a node T is, whether or not it's in the interior node set of some tr tree TQ, or if it's not. And uh, quite interestingly and elegantly, perhaps, this multi-resolution tree constraint can be written as this, this simple difference where for every node T, uh, the following inequality encodes the, the, the condition that if a child node is, is an interior node, then its parent must be as well. And that's encoded by this constraint here. Now, this is nice and all. We've, we've parameterized the tree as, in terms of its interior nodes, but how, what about the mutual information terms? How does this help us? And mutual information is traditionally a very expensive quantity to evaluate. Uh, so what we are going to do is we're instead going to look at the mutual information as a sum of incremental changes between trees. So just, we're going to start basically at the root node of uh, the root tree or the trivial tree T0. And we're going to consider a sequence of expansions where each tree in the sequence differs by only one expansion of a leaf node from its previous tree, all the way until we get to the tree TQ. So the previous here we have T3, that was the previous tree that we're looking at. And what we're going to do here is we're going to instead decompose the mutual information in X and the mutual information in Y, so the relevant information on the compression terms basically, as a, a sum of differences here. So these delta Ys and delta Xs are the incremental changes between trees. Uh, and of course, this is just a, a technique here, which is valid actually for any sort of sequence of trees, but we're going to consider this specific sequence. And it, it may not be obvious uh, why this is, this is helpful, because I mean, I've just expressed things in a different way. But uh, so, you, so the question may be, how does this sequence help? So just to remind you here, let's say we have some tree TI and we have another tree TI plus one, where again, I've labeled the interior nodes and the leaf nodes as follows. And, and it follows actually, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but I'd be happy to talk with anyone offline or so about this, is that it follows that actually the difference between trees and these incremental changes in X and Y information be, between any two trees which differ by only a single expansion can be written in terms of a, an incremental change as a function of only the expanded node. Uh, so basically uh, delta i hat x of t here and delta i hat y of t are just functions of the node which is expanded and moving between tree ti and tree ti plus one. H pi here is, is the entropy of the distribution pi which can be evaluated from the input data and this JS divergence uh, the term here can also be evaluated. It basically tells us how different the children of T are in terms of their, their ability to predict the relevant information. And again, a couple of the points here that I wanted to emphasize in the realization here is that the change in information is only a function of the expanded node. And this is quite important because it actually results in a, in a tractable expression that, that, that quantifies this incremental change instead of having to sum over the, the sample spaces of T and Y. Um, and so, and also that if we start at the root node and we consider a, a sequence 
sequence of expansions where each tree uh, differs only from its previous one by only a single expansion, then every tree in the space of, of multi-resolution trees can be obtained by starting at the root node and performing such a sequence of expansions. And furthermore, perhaps unsurprisingly, you can show that the X information and the Y information of the root tree, which we called T naught on the, on the previous slide, can, is identically zero. And we kind of expected this because T zero or the root tree is the trivial abstraction where we aggregate all the nodes to a single spot, which defines full, um, full compression and obviously no irrelevant information obtained. And why is this important? Well, it follows then that, that any tree TQ is, is parameterized by its interior nodes. So any sequence that leads from T naught to TQ has to expand all the interior nodes of, of TQ and no more and no less of that. And so basically what this allows us to do is re-express the previous um, neutral information terms, the X and Y information or the X and relevant information here in terms of a sum uh, over the interior node set of any tree T cube. And this is, this is important because it, it essentially lets us parameterize the tree, both in terms of the tree being fully characterized by the interior node set, but also the mutual information terms are also completely characterized in terms of the uh, interior node set. So the main result of our paper uh, is basically the following mixed integer program where we're basically, this is exactly the same program we had before, which was minimizing I, the IX information uh, and IY information where basically this, this Z transpose delta X, this delta X vector here, this is a vector which uh, contains the, the incremental changes of X information for every interior node T. And this delta Y is another vector which quantifies the, the change in information and relevant information for every interior node T. Now we have these two added constraints, which were not present before, which are the multi-resolution tree constraints. So again, uh, we have this difference, which we talked about before and how this characterizes basically that the, that the vector Z has to correspond to a feasible tree, multi-resolution tree. And this Boolean being the fact that, you know, every node is either expanded or not. Uh, this set B that I have here, this is the set of, of nodes that have expandable children, uh, the details of which are not that important for the purposes of this talk, but we can, we can discuss that some more. So to demonstrate the utility of this approach, uh, we, we considered a numerical example. Uh, so to reiterate here, this is the linear program that we're, or the mixed integer program that we're, that we're considering. And what we've done here is we we're considering 128 by 128 environment where the relevant variable here is elevation. Uh, so we're going to assume that the that the map uh, represents the conditional distribution PY given X. And just to reiterate, the, the, the original cells here are the finest resolution cells. Uh, so there are 128 squared of those outcomes of X in this example. And we're going to assume that the joint distribution is then given by PXY, where we're provided a PX and a PY given X, where PY given X, again, is the map. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate abstractions here as a function of D hat and hopefully see uh, that we trade re information retention for compression and vice versa. Now to compare, since we didn't want to just run this in isolation, there are a couple of existing methods for sort of information theoretic tree abstractions that exist in literature. One method of which is called the QTree search, which we published late last year in, in TRO. Uh, but this is a, it's, it's a distinct method in that it's, it's, it has another parameter beta, which we can talk about offline, but also what we're going to do is we're going to consider LP uh, relaxations of the problem where we, where we relax this integrality constraint and instead consider Z to be in the closed interval zero one. Okay, so uh, the results are as follows. So um, again, just to remind you what the minimization problem is here, we're minimizing here uh, over the space of trees. Uh, that maximize compression and retain at least D hat units of relevant information. This is the original map here in the corner. And uh, each one of the tree, each one of the multi-resolution images A through C here are obtained by solving our uh, integer program. Uh, and as we, as we increase D, uh, we, we indeed move from the left to the right. This is called the normalized information plane where basically we have decreasing values of compression moving to the right, and we have more relevant information retained as we move up. And this is normalized by the total amount of available relevant information in the environment, which can be computed from the input statistics. And so as, again, as we go from A to C, we are basically increasing the, the level of D hat. So we're increasing the amount of relevant information we'd like to retain here. And we can see indeed that we're trading compression and relevant information in, in 
in, in the form that we had discussed earlier. We are also seeing quite good agreement with uh, our previously published work of Qtree search. You can barely even see the points they are behind the mixed integer programming points there. And also uh, quite interestingly is that the LP relaxation is performing surprisingly well here and actually uh, also providing very consistent solutions uh, as compared to the mixed integer program and the Qtree search method. And so with that, uh, I'd like to just summarize quickly and provide the key takeaways of what the talk here was about. So we considered the development of a, of a framework to generate multi-resolution information theoretic abstractions. And we did so by invoking the IB principle and, uh, to retain the maximal relevant information for a given level of compression, given only the input statistics, so how this uh, X and relevant variable are correlated. Uh, and uh, we discussed how we could reparameterize the constrained uh, optimization problem in terms of the interior nodes of a given tree. And we showed how, how this problem could be reformulated as an integer linear program. Uh, currently, our ongoing work is extending this framework to incorporate site or confidential information, which is useful in situations where perhaps we don't just have some uh, a relevant variable, but maybe we also know something that's irrelevant or maybe something that's confidential that we'd like to also remove from the map or from our abstraction. And so that's ongoing work that we're currently doing. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and thank you for your attention and uh, open up for any uh, questions. Thank you. We have uh, some time for a few questions. So I have a question. Yeah. So thank you for the talk. Um, so let's say uh, I have a grid and mm -hmm. uh, for each grid element, there is also, and now this goes back to the previous talk and the discussion we had, for each grid cell, I have mm -hmm. an input action. So let's say I came up with this grid environment and each control actions for each grid cells that let's say control the robot, correct? Mm -hmm. So now this is how I can control the robot, but this grid environment is very large. I mean, I can of course store that uh, grid style controller inside the robot, but let's say I want to use your techniques using this information theoretic approach and, and compress the size of the controller by grouping the cells and maybe those who share the control. Do you think there is a way that uh, I can, one can actually use I mean, not your method directly, but somehow the same style of reasoning here for compressing the size of controller. One drawback is we need to preserve the correctness of the controller. That's important, you know? It needs exactly. to be like a complete fitting. I don't know how do you how you exactly do that. Exactly. Yeah, th this is this is a this is a really good question. And actually something I think is related to something my advisor Panos and Depanka, who's probably on the call too. I don't know if, if you have something to provide in addition here. But uh, you know, in compressing basically MDPs using something like this, where you have an MDP and you have some action or some policy you're following, now you'd like to perform the compression so that you preserve some relevant quantity. I think it can be done. I don't know that it's necessarily obvious how to do it, um, but you're right. It comes down to exactly defining in some statistical sense, right? Because this is a statistical framework what exactly that is relevant and how it's related to the original cells or the original signal. I think it can be done. We've done some thinking about it, but it's not obvious to me at the moment precisely how that can be done. Mm -hmm. But we can maybe follow up uh, with another discussion. Okay. Thank you. I think yeah. I can add one point to that, Daniel. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. The 2017 CDC paper that Daniel Brown was a part of, where uh, there was a concept of aggregating Markov decision cells, yep. and that also aggregated the action space. But yep. that work, if I remember correctly, needed to define some actions which are kind of aggregated actions too, which is a little bit different than the actions you have in your yep. finest resolution cells. So that type of action aggregation might be needed here as well. And as you know, Mazi very uh, nicely said, the, the safety of the controller, that's the important thing. I think uh, that would be very difficult or challenging in this case, because you can guarantee safety on a multi-resolution environment, but that might not translate similar way into a finite, uh, final resolution environment. So what kind of guarantees can you translate from one resolution to another is, I think, going to be a challenging part here. 
but it's very interesting and very um, very good questions yeah maybe another very quick question um so you know the it was very interesting that the lp relaxation you know in one regime is recovering almost uh, you know the true solution of the mixed mm -hmm. linear program uh, any insight on uh, you know why in that regime LP relaxation seems to have an exact recovery, something like in that regime, you are getting uh, total unimodularity of the- Yeah, body. that's exactly, that's exactly what I think is going on. Um, there's actually a lot of work between uh, integer programming and solving the problem on say the convex hull of, this, of the solution space, uh, which is I think exactly what you're getting at here with total unimodality. Um, and uh, I haven't actually had too much time to, to explore that or, you know, look more in detail with that. But I believe that what's going on here is that the con there, there is a lot of work between finding spanning trees for, for graphs and formulating that as an, as an integer program. And those sorts of problems have those sorts of properties. And I think it's very likely that actually what we have here is something also very similar. So I think that's what's going on uh, here, but I don't have a definitive proof or really a definitive answer, but I, you're right on the spot. I think it has to do with total unimodality of Perfect. the constraints. Perfect. Okay, let's thank the speaker again and uh, we'll move to the next talk. Okay, um, the next talk is on computation about distributed optimization over networks, a hybrid